Thank you. Please be seated. Good morning. This is the time set for oral argument in our cause number CATX 16-003, BSI Holdings LLC versus Arizona Department of Transportation. Um, Council, we are recording today's proceedings, both audio and video recording. So when you step to the podium, please identify yourself and your client. Each side will have 20 minutes for argument, and appellant's counsel, that's you, Mr. Engel, uh, would be responsible for watching the clock on the podium and reserving any time for oral argument that you desire. Um, we've read the briefs. We've conferenced the case prior to argument. We find this to be an interesting case, which is good news for you. So uh, with those preliminaries out of the way, Mr. Engel, you may proceed. May it please the court. Uh, my name is Mark Engel. I'm representing the Department of Transportation, and I'd like permission to reserve five minutes of my time for rebuttal. The court asked the question of whether uh, based in the state is synonymous with presence. Uh, the answer is no. Uh, the answer of no is found in Title 288341, subsection C, uh, which deals with maintenance aircrafts. The definition of a maintenance aircraft is as follows. It's an aircraft that is not based in the state, but that is present in the state solely for the purpose of maintenance. So we see that base, an aircraft's base does not equal presence. We also see that a temporary destination, such as coming to the state for maintenance, doesn't change one's base. At trial court, ADOT argued that this aircraft in question had a single base of Arizona. Uh, throughout the entire period and that no exemptions applied um, specifically the 0.1 percent rate uh, that BSI seeks is in a, uh, does not apply because that exemption is only applicable to aircraft with multiple bases tell, council tell us how an aircraft is based becomes based in the state let's let's get that right sure. out there sure and uh, the, the interesting part about this case is that the court can actually conclude that this aircraft was based in Arizona without actually defining based. Uh, let me explain. So, well, let me cut to the chase. Sure. We know it's based in Arizona. They agree that it's registered exactly. with the department. I don't think there's any dispute that under 288322 it is based in Arizona. It's registered here. But 8336 reuses that language based in, but also attaches a, a temporal sure. aspect to it. So, what does the based in mean in that context? Um, in that context, uh, so essentially how ADOT interprets this, ta uh, interprets this statute is, again, for this specific case, uh, if it was based here and solely in Arizona, as they admit, the question then becomes, was it based elsewhere? Um, we see from the maintenance statute that a temporary destination uh, does not change one's base, and the record reflects that every flight that this aircraft took was for vacation. Where do we find in this statutory scheme that the key inquiry is, was it based elsewhere? I don't see that. I see the, the, the key inquiry is, was being, was it based in the state for more than 90 days, but less than 210 days? I think it's inherent. Um, it's, in, uh, it's inherent in the exemption on 83, under 288336. Um, when it's talking about, was it based in Arizona for a period of time? Um, and then it looks into whether it was, I guess, the, on the flip side, it must then be based elsewhere. Um, so as far as wait, what the term... Wait, so are you saying that if it is based here for a period of time, it is necessarily based someplace else? No, and in, in, in I'm saying that an aircraft, the, the tax statute reads for 8335, that an aircraft that is based in this state and subject to registration is subject to the 0.5% rate unless an exemption applies, which kicks you down to 288336, right? In that statute, it's our contention, it's our position that the language, the text of it, it only applies to an aircraft with multiple bases. Is that how you defended this in the tax court? It seemed to me you defended based on the competing definitions of days. Um, well, I, that's a good question. And I started uh, the, the ADOT's cross motion for summary judgment. The first section, page two, was this argument that ADOT, ha the aircraft in question, 
only had one base and it was here the entire time. The fact that it went on vacation destinations, which was the sole purpose of this plane, was to transport an Arizona resident around the country, um, did not change that aircraft's base. Um, so we did get into discussions on, on what a day is, um, but that's only if the court determines that based equals presence. If based equals presence, then we're counting, we're, we're counting where the aircraft was present at all times during a calendar year. But does, if we say that based indicates presence and you're hopping all over the country, it's based in every place it lands? No, uh, again, so I guess to, to the point or to the initial question is how do we define based? Um, so we flipped to the plain and ordinary meaning, right? I'm sorry, the, the plain and ordinary meaning. So the most applicable definition that I found was in Webster's Dictionary, um, the 1993 edition, and it said that based means the location um, the location that one initiates its operations from and that it relies on its support services from. So in this case, if we're just going to step through that definition of base, apply it to the facts, this aircraft was uh, initiated its operations from Arizona, right? Because the primary purpose, the, the sole purpose of this aircraft was to fly an Arizona resident around who lived down the street in Scottsdale. So that's why this aircraft, it was controlled by an Arizona resident. It was kept here to serve, um, to facilitate family trips, to facilitate um, these vacation destinations. So it initiated all of its operations here. It lived here, so to speak. It may have gone elsewhere, but then it came back. But the problem I have with this argument is, is your whole audit was based on calculating numbers of days. That's why you sent them the assessment saying they're, they're plane was here for 210 days or more. I, if it's as simple as what you're arguing here today, why wasn't that the basis upon which the assessment was made and the case was defended? I, I'm having a little difficulty with what this argument um, seems It's to our be. position that it, it was attempted to be defended in this simplistic way. Um, the trial, it, from just the standpoint of this aircraft has one base, it was here the whole time. Um, but the trial court went another way and but God. that's not how the assessment was, was managed. The assessment was based on the calculations using that software and then later the pilot's log. I mean, sure. none of this seems consistent with how ADOT did the assessment here. Um, well, it is. Um, it was in, 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 it is consistent and from our perspective. But so we know that if we're strictly counting days, um, that the exemption that opposing counsel seeks, the 0.1 percent, if an aircraft is here for greater than 210, 209 days, that exemption cannot apply, right? So then if we conduct a day count, that's how we got into the, the issue of how to count days. Um, so their position is that it has to be 24 hours within the geographical boundaries of this state, um, which was flushed out and it was, it was hard to pick up on. Um, but it was flushed out on page 44 of their answer. Uh, so under that method, I, we can prove that it's wrong, right? So it's uh, one of the consequences if you step through the intent and taking into the, the effects and consequences is that method of county days in that manner is impossible to administer. And I can demonstrate it by one flight. If on, let's say, January 1st, an aircraft took off from Flagstaff at 11 p.m. at night, and it landed in Miami, Florida, January 2nd at 3 a.m. in the morning. The question becomes, ADOT has to administer this tax. Was, should January 1st be counted as a day? If the court rules that it has to be 24 hours within the geographical boundaries for that activity on the 1st, it's impossible to determine where that was in a day, because the ultimate question becomes, when, where was that aircraft when the clock struck midnight? If the aircraft was within Arizona, it's a day, because it was within Arizona for the 24 consecutive hours. If it left the state prior to the clock striking midnight, it's not a day. 
right? Because their contention is from noon, from midnight to midnight, it has to be here, right? So the legislature told, tells ADOT to inspect the pilot logs to count these days. That data of where that aircraft was at midnight is not there. In fact, it doesn't exist, right? Because the FAA governs the rules in the sky, right? There is no requirement that this aircraft log when it crossed from one state into a next. Without that data, we can't calculate days under their method. So it would be impossible for ADOT to do. The second consequence um, it would be that it can treat like taxpayers differently. Um, the best example would be uh, a flight from Lake Havasu, let's say at 1 p.m., and it flew to same day it flew quickly to Flagstaff, and it landed at 2. The question becomes, to administer this tax, is that a day? Again, using their method, 24 without hours within the geographical boundaries, it seems simple, but the problem is Lake Havasu's airport is on the Nevada-Arizona border. So if the airplane took off from Lake Havasu, swooped into Nevada, and then landed in Flagstaff, that is not a day under their method because it wasn't here 24 consecutive hours. It left Arizona and came back. However, if it took off from the east side of the runway, stayed within Arizona the entire time, that would then be a day. Again, the problem is there is no data that exists to show whether this aircraft flew into another state and came back. Therefore, this method is impossible to administer. And again, if there was two flights and they left five minutes apart and they went from Lake Havasu to Flagstaff, one of them went in there, one of them went into Nevada, the other one didn't, we're treating two exact, two taxpayers who are in the exact same position differently. One is going to be taxed, it falls into the, ta you know, tally, that day is tallied, one isn't. The last problem um, that happens is their assessment creates an irrebuttable, basically the, the assessments become irrebuttable. And to explain that, um, let's say that each of you own an aircraft and I as ADOT conducted an audit and I sent the 5% rate to Judge Jones, Downey and Kessler. And you get it and you say, you know what, every day I flew from Flagstaff to Lake Havasu City and I love looking at Las Vegas. So I flew, had my pilot fly me outside of Arizona back in to, on the way to Lake Havasu so I could look at the Vegas nightlife. And you say, this isn't right. I flew outside of the state, right? So it wasn't, I wasn't here 24 hours for any of those days. The problem becomes, ADOT, the, the statutes say, the assessments are presumed to be correct. And the burden is on either of you as plane owners to show the state that it's in error. That data doesn't exist. You, phys you cannot do it. You could not show ADOT or any court that your plane traveled from Flagstaff into Nevada and then landed back on Arizona ground. Why couldn't you do that? Why couldn't you have a pilot come in or just tes testify, an affidavit that said, every day I flew this, I, I left air Arizona airspace, I suppose, even for 30 seconds. Sure. I suppose, and I concede that that uh, could be, um, that could happen. However, as far as administratively, for, again, ADOT, think of the auditors sitting at their desks who get the pilot log. You, you do an audit and you say, okay, you're here for all those days. Right. I come back with an affidavit. I'm, I have to prove it. I have to show the, that, that it wasn't here. So I file an affidavit and I say, I flew it every day and I flew it over Las Vegas. That solves it. I mean, that makes it easy to deal with. I mean, it's hard for the auditor because the auditor can't tell, but the auditor st starts the presumption that we're going to give it the higher tax rate. And where this collapses is that the legal premise is that this tax is a 24-hour geographical boundaries tax, right? So we know, and again, I want to completely stay within the framework of the statutes to disprove it. So we know that it's not. If you look at Title 28 tax administered by ADOT is fuel tax, which is a tax that I do. 
That specific imposition of the tax statute says for fuel that's trucked or railed into the Arizona, the imposition of the tax occurs. The geographical boundaries impose the tax. This tax does not say that. If the legislature intended for this tax to be a geographical boundaries tax, it would have said it, and it didn't. So as far as these consequences, they all occur because we're taking, we're essentially trying to back into a way to reduce tax, right? So they occur because the ultimate foundation of their argument is that this is a geographical boundaries tax. That's how this tax planning idea, I think, came out. Right. Before you save your time for rebuttal, sure. let me ask you this. Hypothetically speaking, if we agreed with your interpretation of the statute, um, their estoppel claim is, is still outstanding and was not resolved by the Superior Court. Is that correct? That is, I argue that, you know, it was briefed. But the Superior Court specifically said they don't reach it. That's so, correct. So that would have to go back even if you're correct on That's the statutory correct. interpretation. That's correct. Um, and I'd like to, if there's no further questions, I'd like to. Thank you, Counsel. Thank you. Thank you. Counsel, Chief Judge, uh, panel, good morning. Christopher Rapp on behalf of the Appellee BSI um, Holding, which is an Oregon entity, and my client uh, is the owner, was the managing member of that entity. Just to, just to kind of go over and set uh, a little bit of the table before I get to the base is since the audit, 99% of this case has been a battle over what is a day, what constitutes a day, 24 hours, 12 hours, their contention that it is an instance of an event of a presence on the ground versus an element of time. So many times in a deposition, they were asked this question, the aircraft flies in from some other state and lands 10 minutes to midnight, people get out, walk around, leave five minutes later. Their interpretation under 8336 is that that is two days. That is two 24-hour periods under the you know, 0 to 90, 91 to 209, 210 to 365. That is how they interpreted it. This isn't about maintenance schedules or any other types of issues. It is about how you define a day. Judge Kessler raised an issue. Air logs are very, very accurate. They tell you when you took off, when the pilot puts down, when they landed, where they were, and, and what hangar, what maintenance. All of those issues are put on air, airplane logs. In this case, the logs were reviewed by both sides. But the missing information on the log is the exact time that the aircraft exited and entered Arizona. Wouldn't you agree that's not in the log? In the airspace? Yeah. Yes, Judge, you're correct. That's right. If you look at 8327, when you're requesting an exemption, you're to furnish your pilot logs to ADOT. How in the world is ADOT to determine, as Mr. Engel pointed out, when your aircraft left Arizona and when it returned? It, it can have some, some broad brush ideas, but when, when your position is that it makes a difference, it's 1159 or 1201, how would they do that? Well, they would determine when it, when it touched down and, and how long it was in Arizona at that time. That's not the border. I mean, it, it would have entered well, Arizona Judge, airspace sometime before well, arriving at the Scottsdale Airport. Judge, you're getting into airspace, which was not even an issue. The issue was when it was inside Arizona. That's exactly so, what we're saying. The well, borders of Arizona aren't where all the airports are located. And, and my question to you is, what keeps a person from simply saying, I took off, we wandered out, and, and, uh, and you know, the lights in Las Vegas are nice. I mean, your, your client's got a nice big jet. He, he flies to Las Vegas just to look at the lights occasionally. And, and that's perfectly fine if that's what he wants to do. Does he then get exempted because of the fact that he went a little wide on his turn and, oh. and went into Mexico California, Colorado, or or uh, or Nevada. Well, Judge, uh, you're getting it now. Are you saying he's landing in Las Vegas? Have I got that correctly? No, no, no. no, no, no. Then, then, Judge, that it's it's the audit in this case, which is completely missed, was that he's in Arizona. If he if he leaves Arizona and touched down, they never went into airspace outside or inside of borders. 
So the so question don't you, don't you argue though in your pleadings that that it's it's the leaving Arizona that is the determination? The leaving Arizona for another destination that he lands. That's what was argued, Judge. It was never argued. Land in San Diego. If I leave here and I land in San Diego just long enough to grab a Coke and a sandwich and turn around and fly back to Arizona, I'm out of Arizona for the day. Is that correct? You, you're you out of Arizona for the day. But yes, let me Judge. make sure I understand because it's an important point. So, so you would respond to Mr. Engel's scenario that I leave Lake Havasu and instead of going directly to Phoenix, I go through Nevada airspace, but I don't land in Nevada. You, your client's position is I am based in Arizona on that day. Well, we're we're in Arizona for that whatever period of that time. Would count. That's, yes, there's that's for that Arizona, was the right? audit, Judge. You you're you're drifting into an area. I've been involved in this case three, three, four years. I've never heard about anybody talk about airspace well, you outside. Made that of point that. in the brief. That, that well, we we cross, but we 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 state where the aircraft takes off and lands. If it's Arizona, that's what's counted, and that's what the audit counted, and we agreed to that. But you see. So you're, so you're saying that if your client, Norris Pilot, flew over the Grand Canyon from Arizona, took off from Arizona, flew over the, over the Grand Canyon, said, let's go over to Utah for 30 seconds. Don't land, just take a little loop over to Utah and come back and land in Arizona. That still counts as a day? Yes, Judge. He was in Arizona. The, 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 not the, the physical presence of landing on the ground, but the, the logs would show Arizona, Arizona, Arizona. In fact, their logs and their determination of numbers was based on that, and we agreed to that, Judge. If our client left Phoenix and landed in Lake Havasu 12 hours later, but took a, a traipse around, I don't know, pick another state, Utah, Wyoming, something, and came back, then there was no, that was Arizona. That's how it was counted, Judge. Let me make sure I'm, I'm, okay. I'm with you. If your client flies over Las Vegas for 10 seconds, comes back, takes off from Arizona, flies over to Las Vegas for 10 seconds, lands, in, lands back in Arizona the same day, talking all about the same day, that's based in Arizona that day. Arizona. If he takes off, lands in Las Vegas, grabs a Coke, comes back or drops off a package, comes back, not in Arizona. Depends on the day, but yes. If, but just, just, let's keep he's, it he's outside of, he's, I'm, I'm he's, 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 he's landed. <laughs> well, I'm a simple guy. I, but but, but the, I, the bottom I, line is he landed and he's in another, for another seconds, jurisdiction. For, for a minute. For, just for a minute. Just, you know, lands, grabs a Coke, you know, drops off a package, whatever it is, a couple of minutes, it's allowed to take off right away, comes right back to Arizona. That's not in Arizona. That's not in Arizona. That's not, doesn't, that doesn't count as a day. It, 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 in, in, Judge, you have a, so, Judge, let me ask you, when the, when, the pro, when the Department of the Transportation gives out this exemption, they have the client sign an exemption mm -hmm. affidavit, and it's, it's Exhibit A to our motion for summary judgment was filed May 5th, 2015. In that, in that document that's, that's promulgated, published, everything by them, they have the client admit they're a non-resident for aircraft registration purposes. They, they, they say the estimated length of stay of my aircraft in Arizona during the calendar year will be 0 to 90, 91 to 209, right? We check to 91 to 209. While the aircraft is in Arizona, it is based generally at, it is based generally at Scottsdale Kirlin Airport, correct? So that's their document that my client signed 2006 all the way through the audit period of 2012 to this current day. That is their document, this, their definition of what we're supposed to comply with. Okay? Now, if the legislature wants to define days in the way the court is, is talking about, well, what about airspace? What about, then the legislature has to put a definition of days. But in right now, when there is an ambiguity, it has to be construed strongly in favor of the taxpayer. Another issue, can, Judge. Can I follow up on that? Sure. You told us a little bit about the effort in 2013 to define day. Um, can we read anything one way or the other into that as to legislative intent? Well, I think that, that, that they're, they're, they're deciding this, uh, this 
concept of, hey, when the aircraft touches on the ground in Arizona, it counts as a, tw as a day. And we're saying, wait a minute, where, where, where is that noticed, published, you know, some sort of substantive policy statement? Where is that so that the public, the taxpaying public can say, oh, that's how we figure a day? You're answering a different question. I understand okay. your point about policy rulemaking. I was on the ASU versus, versus ASRS case. Um, I understand that issue, but my question's a little different. I have some questions because, on that. Because if we start from the premise that the statute is ambiguous, whether you agree with that or not, then we employ these secondary tools of construction, dictionary definitions, legislative intent, and I'm just trying to f figure out what, if anything, we can make of that 2013 legislative effort to define day. There, well, there was no legislative effort to define day. There was a there was a dot saying this is what we are calling a day. There is no, as Judge Witten put out, both in based and days. There is no definition of days. No, I'm in, talking about the footnote in your answering brief that following BSI's protest, um, there was a strike all bill to repeal 288336 and to define definition of day as a span of 12 consecutive hours within a calendar day when the aircraft was parked in Arizona. That's what I'm talking about. That's well, that, but, it, but it failed, Judge. It was never passed. It never got so what, how, do we, how do we read that, that it failed? There's an attempt to well, say, I mean, is that attempt because someone's complaining that, gee, uh, ADOT's saying if you're here for a minute, you're, you're present. So the legislature tries to say, okay, we're going to make it 12 hours. And it fails. Which, well, which, which way does that cut? Well, I think that cuts that they're trying to define day as a length of time and not an instance of, of, of an event. Right. But, but weren't able to do so. They weren't able to do so. But, well, Judge, I, I have fairly limited knowledge on what why that failed. I know that the, the aviation industry is was extremely upset after 2012 at this new definition of a day, and there's been a lot of issues regarding. So, so I, am, I, am I understanding that you're saying, well, since that failed, it would go back to what ADOT has defined it as, as an instance of, of, a, of a presence on the ground. I don't well, if, if someone comes to the legislature and says, we're upset with ADOT, because ADOT's saying, you land, you're present. So they, they lobby the legislature and say, make it 12 hours, and that fails. Doesn't that mean that that, that, falls, that, that basically the legislature knew that ADOT was saying a mo, a, you know, a, a couple of hours in Arizona is enough. A couple of hours landing in Arizona is enough, and there and and they and they refused to change refused to change the statute, knowing what the legislative what the administrative interpretation was. Then let me raise this because they raised that right, in right, 2013. Before you, Jeff, before you before you raise it, well, I'm going to answer you, your question. Are you saying are you saying that you don't know why what what the impetus was to change that? To change the statute. Uh, to change the statute to the 12 hours? Yeah. Oh, I do. But uh, it was it was to try to stop this late effort to define this when the audit period goes on from 2004 to 2012. And then all of a sudden after 2012, you find out, hey, guys, this is the way we define day. They didn't talk about maintenance as, as statutes or any of those things. They said, this is how we define day. Uh, no, you're just trying to to pump the 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 statute to everybody pays the resident rate the point five okay. so the question is is in that there there certainly is an effort i understand there's still an effort going forward not not with chris rapps involved in it but the the question is when you come through the audit period and you go to the audit period and you say well, we, the, here's our flight logs. Here's our days. We've counted our days properly. They're all within the 91 to 209 time. We pay this at all times. My client pays its, its tax, imposed tax. Just one other, I'm going to shift just one other because there's another statement by ADOT in regard to this case that I think is germane to the court's inquiry on based and days. In 2004, we, we entered into a protest over the aircraft, and there was a settlement agreement that was, was drafted and executed by ADOT that covered years 2003, 2004, and ostensibly 2005. In that document, ADOT uh, 
ADOT stated, the department accepts taxpayers' representation that the calendar to 2004 is a non-resident, and it will be in present in Arizona for more than 90 days, but less than 210 days. That was an agreement that they executed, they drafted, and they put in. And where is, there's nothing in it in the thing that says you're based here, as, as my colleague, my opposing colleague says, you're based here, and so that's automatically over 210 days. There's nothing like that. They accept that. But I as understand a, why that relates to your estoppel claim. I don't understand how that helps us in a de novo interpretation of the statute. Well, Judge, in the de novo interpretation of the statute, if, if the, this court is trying to say what a day is, you have to look at the common in, in, in used meaning of the day. You have to look at what the statutory intent was when this constitutional amendment under Article 9, Section 15 said zero to 90. It said days. I'm just not making the connection between the closing agreement and our statutory construction. Because at that time, Judge, they have a an ample opportunity to define what they said. Judge Kessler said, well, couldn't it have been that was what they meant during that period of time or after 2012? Well, I don't know, but it wasn't at that point. It wasn't at 2000, October of 2004 when they signed this agreement. Yes, but, the, but, the, but your argument is they later changed that, and then the people went to the legislature to, to say, listen, we've got to define day, and that fails. But, but I want to get back. How does that – that may be fine as far as the 2004 – what Judge Downey's talking about, as far as the 2004 tax year and maybe an estoppel argument – that's, that was maybe, maybe not their view as far as 2000, 2000, 2004, but how does that help us to say, okay, well, if that's what their view is, that's how we define the statute. Are you well, saying that's because there's an administrative gloss on this as of 2004 that day means 24 hours? I, I, I am saying that, Judge. I'm saying that they define day as a period of time. Look, Judge, the law is replete with – partial days and, and I, I, yeah, we understand, right, we understand, we understand that. that but so, so you're so you're in, in answering judge downey's question what you're saying is if the statute's ambiguous you look to see what the legislative what the administrative interpretation is the administrative interpretation is 24 hours we can unless unless it's clearly wrong we can defer to not defer to it but we put some we put some some deference to that interpretation and that's what you're saying. In 2004, ADOT said 24 hours was a day. Well, they didn't, they didn't say 24 hours. They said, they said days, and they never defined it. And their exemption certificate, which they published, could have said, by the way, a day is. Okay. They also have pamphlets. They have websites. Nothing ever, ever states. And in fact, in numerous deputies, okay. <laughs> I got you. I got okay. you. Thank you. Let me ask you a hypothetical question. If we were to interpret the statute the way ADOT does, very hypothetical, is there a question of fact to be remanded to the tax court about whether the jet was based in Arizona for more than or 210 days or more? Is there a factual issue and, under their interpretation? And you're making a determination that day is what? That if you're in Arizona for part of a day, exactly what ADOT's position is. For a second? Is there a, is there a factual is there a factual issue about the jet being in Arizona for the requisite number of days? Yeah, and, and I don't rehab those. We did those figures, Judge, below, but there was mostly, at, at my understanding, is they would, would have been over, under their analysis, over 210 days. But there is a significant factual issue as to what, what that would mean in going through the flight logs again. What's the factual issue? I mean, well, whether if, the if, aircraft we, if, if, let, me, let me just posit again the hypothetical. Mm. Hypothetically, we agree that if this plane is in Arizona, um, according to ADOT's position, for 10, sa 10 minutes, it counts as a day, okay? Is assuming that we, d we agree with that, is there a factual dispute about on any given of, on any of those 210 days, or more than 210 days, that the plane was not in Arizona. I I do not remember the numbers in regard to that, Judge. We did prepare them, 
and they did prepare them, and we had competing battles. But I would have to, I'd have to say that they, for in most cases, it might have been over 210 days. I think there was a couple of years that it was not, but okay. over 210 days, Judge, and then and going into the higher tax bracket. Okay. 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 Judge Danny, I don't, did I answer your question? I'm not quite um, sure. I think you answered his question. <laughs> so you want me to try again? No, thank you. Okay. A question you from your question? No. Mm -hmm. Okay. <laughs> so the statute, Judge, there, there is uh, an interpretation that um, in, this, in this matter that the, 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 there was some clear definition. There was some uh, uh, known or, or a, a discussed or within the taxpaying community and the public community what a day, what 24 hours or 12 hours or what it meant. I'm going to go into an area that I would like not to, but Judge uh, Kessler raised it in terms of my understanding of the 12 hour and the failure of that legislation. I mean, if, if the, the, that there were issues regarding whether the aircraft was on, whether the aircraft, there was a whole bunch of side issues of what it meant to be operational and not just parked in there and, and not taking up any, any runway or any, um, Type of type of issues. So I am. Wow, this time goes fast, doesn't it? Uh, I got 22 <laughs> seconds, Judge. I'm going to start in with any ambiguity has to be strongly construed against the government and in favor of the taxpayer. And that is the basic. That's Capital Castings case. And I'm just raising that that this statute that you should affirm Judge's decision, and and also affirm the decision on attorneys' fees below. Thank you, Judge. Thank you. Judges. Rebuttal, Mr. Engel. Two points just to hopefully end this matter in ADOT's favor. The opposing counsel said that, quote, airspace is not an issue. Um, I don't mean to read the record back at the court because I know you're, you're, you've done so, so I don't mean to be insulting, but um, just on page 44 of their answer, it says, while the 36-minute flight on the evening of March 19, 2008, was likely a simple test flight to check avionics, landing flights, landing gear, or some other component of the aircraft, it is clear that the aircraft did not leave Arizona airspace and likely just circled the Phoenix metro area and returned to the Scottsdale airport. The fact that the aircraft was airborne for 36 minutes, and always in Arizona airspace, which is in italics, and was not during that brief flight on the ground for the full 24 hours, does not mean that it was other than present in Arizona for the full day. So you're saying the italics are a limiting criteria? I'm saying that he, I'm saying that he gauged the temperature of the room and changed kind of the, the, the def we know, he said that airspace is not an issue, but in his own brief, he said that that flight was counted as a day because it was within Arizona. In your Arizona calculations Air in the trial court. Right. Was there a space an issue? If they, if they left, if the, if the flight left Scottsdale at 1 p.m. Yeah. Flew over the Grand Canyon. Mm -hmm. and we're all in one, the same day. Flies for 30 seconds into Utah, doesn't land, and comes back. Does that make a difference? In this case, yeah, absolutely. Because they're, again, based on their definition of the day, it, it does, it's either, the geographical boundaries either matter or they don't, right? So it's here, he, I mean, I think you can get where the questioning was going, but, um, so he tried to basically create some sort of caveat that is new about, oh, well, now it only, they only matter if you go outside and you actually land. But if you cross the borders and then you come back in the state, from, from then they that, don't count, ADOT, right? That, from ADOT's position, sure. it doesn't matter at all because it Correct. was still in Arizona for part of the day. But you're saying down below their position was if it flew over Las Vegas and landed back in Arizona the same day, it wasn't in Arizona for that day. I'm saying that's true, but I'm saying that that's also their position now, as I've seen in their answer. And that. Right. Um, and then to the notion of uh, the touch and go. So as far as when the air, the aircraft is in Arizona for a mere second, right? Um, it seems to be his, you know, like a almost like a confetti argument where the ceiling opens up and that's how he wins. But let me explain. That's an actual thing. Um, 
the touch and goes are done by that's a training technique, right? So it's for pilots have so many flight hours. And the way that you maximize training on landings is that you descend, you hit the runway, then you take back off and you repeat. Instead of descending, hit the runway, taking it to the hangar, and then going back out again, right? So what do we know if the, if the record showed that an aircraft conducted a touch and go? That aircraft will be owned by an Arizona entity. So that aircraft in that hypothetical will be, you, will be subject to tax at the 0.5% rate. That aircraft used to conduct that flight testing or that flight training technique will be kept here. So in the, in the, the best, I don't know, it seemed like the, you know, his, the best argument um, that he was trying to seem to make was with these touch and goes and how this spawned this legislation. No, it didn't because those touch and goes are subject to the 0.5% rate unquestionably. So we know that um, in, in that hypothetical, that plane will be taxed in the same manner that ADOT taxed his client's aircraft. Um, I, the state has, unless there's any other questions, we don't have any more remarks. No, thank Thanks. you. Um, thank you both for your presentations. We will take this matter under advisement and issue a ruling in due course. At this time, the court stands in adjournment.